We're appealing to the fact that this is not an abnormal thing. In fact, it's a best practice of world-class type companies. And so by doing that, we feel like we're in a pretty safe thing. And if anyone ever comes to us and says, hey, you're illegal, I'm going to sue you. We can say, hey, that's fine. You have a right to do that. But there are much bigger fish to fry. Live your faith, build your business, and change your world. This is Live, Build, Change. As Christ followers who are also trying to build and run a successful business, we have all kinds of interesting little tensions that come up. Quite often, as we navigate this entrepreneurial path, there are examples I could give to you just that I've read about or that I've seen, but I thought that one from the real life day-to-day operations of my own podcast production business would be the best to help you see that we've got to be really clear on some very important things if we're ever going to be successful in a kingdom sense. I know that you have a lot of options when it comes to things you put into your earbuds and listen to on a regular basis. And so I greatly appreciate that you have selected the Live, Build, Change podcast. This podcast is all about living your faith in Jesus Christ in an authentic, genuine way, building a business that you can then couple with that faith to change the world in ways that really, really matter. That could be your world in a local level. It could be on a broader scale. It would greatly depend on what God has for you, but that's the point of Live, Build, Change, and I'm thankful that you're here. Today, I wanted to talk to you about something I've been thinking about a lot because I've been dealing with it a lot, and that is the issue of maintaining your Christian standards as you run a business. Most of us have probably heard about or read about the story of the Christian couple who ran a bakery up in the Oregon area of the United States and were asked to bake a cake for a gay couple who were wanting that wedding cake to celebrate their civil union or their gay marriage, as they call it. And it's one of those things that, you know, everybody seems to have an opinion about. Some people feel like, what's the big deal? Bake the cake is a way to love people. And I've heard really devoted Christ followers say that. But I've heard others say that, you know, from a conscience standpoint, if that person would have baked the cake, It would have been participating in the celebration of that event and enabling people to celebrate the event, which the baker, by her own admission and conscience, could not celebrate. So she did the right thing in saying she would not bake that cake. Well, that's the kind of issue that I want to talk to you about on this episode, because those kinds of issues, I believe, are very pertinent, very relevant, and are things that we as Christian entrepreneurs may have to deal with on a fairly regular basis. And so I want to talk about what those issues really are about. I want to talk about some approaches you can take to think through those issues and also just tell you some of my story, the things that I've done to both protect myself and to be who I need to be as a believer in Christ before the problems even arise. So let's back up just a little bit and let me tell you a little bit about how I began thinking about this. Now, obviously, I had seen the story about the baker and understood that whole situation, but I hadn't really put myself in her shoes very well, and I hadn't thought it through very in-depth, I guess I would say, until it started happening to me. And here's what I mean. My primary business at this point is a podcast production and show notes creation service. You can see what my team does at podcastfasttrack.com. And in that, we are doing audio editing. We are optimizing audio to make the levels between speakers, for example, in a particular episode be balanced so that they can be heard equally well. We are making the content sound better so that it is more enjoyable and, in the end, more effective for our clients. 
There's another aspect of our business. We write show notes, which are basically the notes, summary uh, statements about the episode in question. And those will include resources that have been mentioned and links to the the host and the guests and their social profiles and things like that. But we write those in such a way that they are optimized for Google search traffic and for Yahoo search traffic and for Bing search traffic. We're trying to get more organic searchers to find that post, read it, and then hopefully become a listener to our client's podcast. And so we're optimizing the writing and the way it's written to help our clients get their message out to a greater degree. Now, that all sounds fine and good, right? Well, I found that I have to start thinking through this issue of living out my Christian faith in the midst of running that kind of business as I've had people approach me who are broadcasting via their podcast about subjects that I do not feel comfortable being a part of broadcasting. Now, let me give you an extreme example so you can see the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Say that a person contacted me via email and wanted to have our company come alongside them and provide them the service that we do. And their podcast topic was going to be about pedophilia and the benefits and joys and wonder of pedophilia. Now, if you don't know what pedophilia is, it means adults having sex with minors. That is an illegal practice. So that, number one, makes it very clear that I shouldn't be participating in this kind of a thing. But forget that it's illegal for a moment. And just think of it from a moral or an ethical standpoint. Okay, just morally and ethically for an adult to take advantage of a child on that sort of a level, the trust that a child normally has in adults and the vulnerability that a child has, that's just a morally wrong thing. Now we bring in the Christian side of it and you have a whole host of other objections to being involved in a podcast that would be promoting that kind of thing. Now, that example has never come across my plate. I don't even know that there is a podcast that speaks about those kinds of topics in an advocacy kind of way. But it's an example of the kinds of things that do come across my email and come into my uh, radar, so to speak, that I do have to deal with. You see, I have people who broadcast quite often about things like the law of attraction. And if you're not familiar with the law of attraction, it's a faulty spiritual premise or truth completely opposite of a biblical worldview that if you concentrate or focus on positive things, you will attract positive things to you. And they call it a law. They say that it's a law of the universe. And you have probably heard all that garbage out there. People talking about the universe willing this and the universe bringing this to them. And it's just all anti-Christian because it leaves out Christ. And so I have people quite often in the entrepreneurial space or in the personal development niche who want our team to provide services for them, but they regularly promote that kind of teaching or that kind of false doctrine, you might say. And what am I supposed to do in a case like that? Do I tell them right away, you know, I can't do your show because I don't agree with your premise? I mean, what is the best way to go about that? Another example that could be helpful is when people come to me wanting to have our team come alongside and help them with their podcast production and show notes. And the topic of their particular podcast is oriented around a gay lifestyle, promoting a gay lifestyle, uh, being an advocate for it. Now, that's a lot more aligned with what the baker was dealing about up there in Oregon. You see, I, as a Christian, do not believe that a gay lifestyle is, first of all, morally correct, but I also don't feel like it is a good and healthy lifestyle for anyone to pursue. And I base those beliefs on biblical teaching. The Bible says that those who pursue that kind of a lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's just very clear. And so they are practicing something that could bring eternal peril into their lives. And I don't want to be a participant in that kind of an outcome. Do you see where my thinking is on this? So with those few examples in mind, I want to give you some of the background of how I've had to deal with this. I've had a few clients who early on in the course of my business 
became active clients. We are producing their episodes. And as I was getting started, I was really the only person doing the audio editing. So I was hearing every episode that my clients are giving to me. And what I discovered was there were clients I already had as a part of my client family, I call them, who were either beginning to or were actively promoting these kinds of topics that I was not comfortable being a part of. But yet they're already clients. They're already paying me. What am I supposed to do in a situation like that? Now, something I have to caution you about here as a Christ follower is that even though you may not think it's going to be an issue for you, you need to be humble enough and honest enough with your own sense of temptation and I guess I just should say it, greed, to realize the money does impact your decision in some ways. doesn't mean you're going to make the wrong decision, but it's going to have a pull on you because these people were already paying me. It was income I was already enjoying. It was already paying my bills. It was already taking care of my family. It was already in my pocket, so to speak. And so to go to a client like that and say, hey, thank you for your confidence in our service. But due to the type of things you're talking about, I can no longer work with you. So please don't give me any more money. That's quite a step to take. It's a step of faith, a step you have to take with faith in God, that he is your provider, not these clients. He is the one who provides for you through clients. And as you take a stand to be consistent with your own moral convictions, God himself will provide for you. That's really where you have to wind up on this. And so in a couple of situations, I had to do that. I had to ask clients to stop being my clients. And consequently, the money quit flowing in from those clients. And I had to deal with the repercussions of that. But I think it was the right thing to do. I think it was the right thing to do in terms of my own personal convictions and integrity as a follower of Jesus Christ. I've had other clients who at first were not producing things that were antithetical to what I believe. They were not antithetical to the things that I felt good about producing. But over time, their themes began to change and their trajectory headed in a different direction. And those were some of the hardest conversations to have because the clients in their mind, it you know, you've been working with them for a long time. What's the matter? Why are you suddenly having this pang of conscience? Well, they didn't see their own change, their own difference in, in direction as clearly as I could because, you know, they're inside their own head. They don't see it as objectively as I do. And thankfully, you know, I thank the Lord for this. In every one of those situations, the clients have responded well, and they've understood that I have this conviction that I have to stand by because they have convictions about things too. And, you know, I would appeal to that. I would say to them, you know, you have convictions that you won't compromise, and I wouldn't expect you to compromise them. I wouldn't ask you to compromise them. I have convictions too, and I can't compromise this. And so they would understand that even if they didn't understand the logic or the reasoning behind my conviction. And so I thank God that that happened in these cases with these clients. But is that really how you should handle it? Should you just take on clients from the beginning and just cut them out later if it turns out that they're not the kind of clients that you need or the kind of customers that you need? Or is there a better way? Well, I want to tell you what I figured out to do And it's nothing I feel like I came up with. I feel like the Lord directed me in figuring this whole thing out. As I thought through this issue, I became aware that there are certain bigger organizations or bigger companies out there that essentially do the same thing I was wanting to do. The case in point that I will point you to is iTunes. You know, iTunes is owned by Apple, but iTunes is a directory through which you can find podcasts and apps for your iPhone, and other things that Apple sells. You know, you do that through the iTunes store. And iTunes, when it comes to podcasts, has a list of subject matter that they will not allow to be listed in their directory. 
Many of those things have to do with things that are illegal, but some of them are not that sort of thing. Some of them are conscious decisions that they have made of the kinds of things they will not allow on their platform. Things like gratuitous violence or hate speech or defamatory sorts of things. And you see, what I noticed there is that they are making their own stand. And by they, I mean the higher ups behind iTunes, the ones who run the company of Apple, I'm assuming, is who's behind all this really. They have made decisions about the kinds of content that they as a company are willing to promote through their iTunes directory. And so I figured I could take a page from their book and begin doing the same kind of thing. But I have to lay it out very clearly like they have done, because they have a whole page on their website that tells you the kinds of content that is not allowed in their directory and the kinds of things you can do once you're in their directory to get your show removed from their directory. Okay. So I figured I had to do something similar and I had to do it in a way that appealed to an example like iTunes to show that I'm not a narrow-minded bigot. I'm not the only one doing this. In fact, very successful companies that are actually admired by much of the population do the very thing that I'm doing. And so that's what I did. I created a page on my website. I call it my why page because it tells why my company is doing what it's doing, what our goals are and the beliefs we have that kind of guide the way that we do business. And as a part of that, I have a section telling the types of content we will not work with. And so you can see that page if you'd like to see an example of what I'm talking about at podcastfasttrack.com slash why podcastfasttrack.com slash why. And you'll scroll down to the bottom and you'll see this section that I'm talking about. And that section alone, I think it does a lot of good for people who come to my website, checking out our services. They see the why page, they click on it to see what our business mission is and that sort of thing. And they get exposed to these company values that are informed by my Christian faith and make it very clear the kinds of content we will produce and the kinds of content we will not produce. And something else I've tried to make very clear on that page is that it's not about a hatred for the people who believe differently than us. In fact, we feel exactly the opposite. We love those people. We love them with the love of Christ. That's my goal as a leader of this company, that our clients, that everyone we interact with will feel cared for and will feel loved. But we simply can't produce certain types of content, certain subject matter and those kinds of things. And so that page, I've tried to make that very clear. And then the page itself is the essential first step, but it's not enough. I have to figure out a way to get that page in front of potential clients more quickly and more easily. And that turned out to be a very simple thing because the way that our onboarding process for new clients works is that our clients request a quote and we give them a quote. And when we do, we send them via email, usually a link to that why page before we get to the numbers, before we get to the process we would use to bring them into the company, before we talk about any of the business stuff. We speak to them about our why, and we do so using terms that are popular in the culture, terms like alignment, terms like values. And we say, we've learned the hard way that it's important that our company and your company be in close alignment so that we can best serve you and you can feel comfortable and confident in the way that we're serving you. Toward that end, we ask you to check out our why page, give them the link, and give us your feedback as to whether you feel there are any issues listed there that would prevent us from working with each other. You see, in that way, every client is able to know from the very outset of their relationship with us where we stand on those issues. I know some clients probably don't read that page. They're just in a pinch. They want someone to produce their podcast and they just skip that part and get going with what they see as the important stuff. But if they do, I feel like we've covered our bases. We've made it clear up front or we've attempted to with our best effort 
so that no client can come back and say, well, you never told me about that. Yeah, I can pull up the email string and I can show them. Yes, we did tell you. We sent you the link right here and we explained it to you in that email why it's important for you to read this. And please be clear on this. The reason we're doing all this is really kind of a double-edged sword. Number one, it's being upfront and honest with our potential clients about who we are and the kinds of content we work with. I just feel like it's the best practice right up front for them to know who it is they're working with. Secondly, there is a legal protection sort of a thing. We are saying it up front. We're making it clear and we're appealing to, so to speak, a company that is greater than us who does a similar thing. We're appealing to the fact that this is not an abnormal thing. In fact, it's a best practice of world-class type companies. And so by doing that, we feel like we're in a pretty safe thing. And if anyone ever comes to us and says, hey, you're illegal, I'm going to sue you, we can say, hey, that's fine. You have a right to do that. But there are much bigger fish to fry in this whole thing if you really want to sue somebody. I mean, Apple is doing the same thing. You see what I'm saying? And I don't expect that would ever deter anyone from suing us. But the point is, we are appealing to someone who is seen as a hero in the entrepreneurial space and in the business realm as an example of doing exactly what we are doing. Now, as we move on, let me tell you some of the responses I've gotten to this kind of a stance. Out of all the potential clients who have been working with us or asking about working with us, who have read that why statement, I've only had one or two out of about four years worth of contacts with potential clients who have come back angry, you know, who are just really upset and offended that we would make such a statement on our why page that we won't work with certain kind of people. The rest, you know, they'll mention, you know, will we believe in gay marriage? In fact, one person said, my business partner is gay and has a committed relationship with his partner. And I wouldn't feel good entering into this relationship because of my loyalty to him. Okay, totally. But they were civil about it. They were understanding. They didn't cause a big stink. They just moved on and found someone else because there are plenty of people plenty of companies that do what we do and they know that they can go find someone else who will do an admirable job for them on their podcast production and show notes. I've had one person who contacted me and their show was legal oriented. And as I got to researching the potential client, I've discovered he was actually a lawyer. And so when I sent him the page about the why and all of that sort of stuff, he responded that he thought what we were doing might be illegal. But he wasn't going to make a big deal about it, and he would just find someone else. I replied to him, and I pointed out that we don't believe it's illegal. In fact, companies like Apple do the same thing. So I feel that we're pretty safe in our stance. And he never replied back. But I wanted him to see that this is not just an issue for Christians. This is an issue across the board, that every individual, every person running a company needs to be able, they need to have the freedom to say, I will not work on certain kinds of content on moral grounds. And we as believers need to do that even more diligently. And we do so in a way that makes Christ look good. And so I think before we wrap up, we should take just a few minutes to talk about what does that really mean? Now, to talk about what it means to make Christ look good when it comes to taking a stance for moral reasons or for biblical reasons, I think we have to understand that some of this has been done very poorly by the church in days past. I mean, we've had people picketing gay marriages. We've had people calling homosexuals nasty names, all kinds of things, which I don't believe is what Jesus has called us to be as his people. You see, people who do not know the saving grace of Jesus Christ, who have not been transformed by his indwelling Holy Spirit, do not have the capacity to live out a moral Christian ethic. 
I mean, think about yourself. You're a believer in Christ. You're one who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and you have a hard enough time living it out, right? Why do we expect non-believing people to live in believing ways and to adopt believing principles and mindsets and morality? It's ridiculous to go after those people with a vehemence because of the fact that they're living as who they are. And that may sound kind of prejudiced or bigoted or all that, but I'm speaking biblical truth here. The Bible says those without the spirit of God cannot please God. You can see that in Galatians chapter 5. We should not approach those people angrily or bitterly. I mean, we can be angry about the fact of what sin has done to our world, but the people that we see practicing, promoting, and even defending the most heinous practices are actually victims of the enemy. Now, don't hear me saying they're not responsible. They are making choices as a moral agent before God, but they are not the ultimate enemy. We have another enemy. We have Satan, who is the enemy of our souls. He's the enemy of their souls, and we need to see it that way. And our attitude, our approach to people who are not of the Christian faith is never to be one of antagonism. We are to be the most compassionate, loving, helpful, kind, merciful people toward people who do not believe the same way that we do. When we get all flustered and angry and hot under the collar, we're no better than those who are a part of radical Islam. We're treating people as enemies when the people are not the enemy at all. In fact, they're the very ones our Savior, the one we say we follow, came to die for. We should have utmost compassion on them and deal with them so gently and carefully for a couple of different reasons. Number one, that is what makes Jesus look really good in their eyes. That is what enables them to see, you know, those Christians, even though they disagree with me on this really essential issue, they're actually loving people. They treated me well. They were kind. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand there will be people who don't see it that way. And just because you're taking a stance or going to be antagonistic, okay, fine. But that doesn't mean we're supposed to respond in like manner. We're to always have our speech seasoned with salt, Jesus said. We're always to be this winsome, attractive, good-smelling aroma of Jesus Christ to those who do not know him. The second benefit that comes from responding that way is that we are able to start changing that non-believer's perception of what a Christian is. Because the bad responses of many within the church up to this point, in combination with slanted media portrayals of what Christians are really like, has given people, especially those in the gay community, this impression, this belief that Christians are hateful angry, prejudiced people, you know, and those are the words that are used to describe us. But when we respond gently, lovingly, with kindness and understanding, yet with a very strong, clear conviction that's spoken in love and with gentleness and respect for the person, they see a living example right before them of a Christian who is not what they think Christians are. And I'm hopeful that enough of us responding that way over time will change the tone of what non-believers believe about Christians. And that by so doing, we'll point them back to that first benefit. They'll start to see Jesus as being appealing and attractive and winsome. And that the Holy Spirit might use both our moral conviction on these issues and our gentle explanation of it and our kind treatment of the people we're having to inform of it to actually bring new brothers and sisters into the kingdom of God. And before we wrap up, let me just say something that I think is obvious from everything I've said already, but I want to say it again just to be sure that we're very, very clear on this. We, as people of Jesus Christ, are called to be holy. Peter tells us about this. He says, Just as he who called you is holy, 
so be holy in all you do. Holiness doesn't mean we have a holier-than-thou attitude where we're preaching at people or, or looking down on them. Holiness means that we hold to standards that are righteous, that are holy, that are right and pure and good. And we do so because as Christ followers, we are called to represent him. In fact, we are told in the epistles that we are ambassadors of Christ. We are to represent him just like an ambassador from the United States is to represent the United States when they go to foreign countries. That's our role. We are in enemy-occupied territory right now. This world is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we are to represent heaven and the things of heaven and the ruler of heaven in the way that we conduct ourselves on this planet. That goes for how we live in our homes. It goes for how we interact with neighbors in our neighborhoods and in our communities. It goes for how we run our business as well. So don't let yourself get caught up in this thing. Well, business is business and it doesn't really have anything to do with my faith. Hey, if that's how you're thinking about your faith, I think you have reason to question the genuineness of your faith. Because true transforming faith in Jesus Christ places Jesus at the place of lordship. He is the king and his constraints and demands on your life come first before anything else. And I don't say that in a judgmental or condemning way. I say that with all the love I can muster because that is what the Bible says. And that is what the church is really supposed to do. Think about how this world would be different. If every believing business person, if every believing teacher, if every person who names the name of Jesus Christ, who is a parent or a lawyer or a ditch digger or a construction worker, were to live out the holiness of Jesus in everything that they do. And don't hear me saying it's easy. I mean, I had to think this issue through quite a bit and I'm not through thinking it through. Because there are ramifications for this. And I guess I should wrap up by saying this. We can't let the potential or the possibility of some kind of legal action toward us prevent us from standing for the righteous standards of our king. We have to be willing to take that stance. You remember back in the Bible, there's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are officials in the Babylonian government of the time. And they, like everyone else in the culture, were commanded to bow to an idol of the king. And the three of them said no. They said it kindly, but they said it clearly. They would not bow. They stood when everyone else knelt. The king called them. He confronted them. And he said, why will you not bow down? And they appealed to their greater loyalty, the loyalty they have to their king their God and king, the one who had told them, have no other gods before me. And they appealed to his greatness and they said, our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, we still will not bow. Christ following family, that is how we have to be in business. I fully expect the day will come if I still have this podcast production business going that someone is going to get antagonistic about it. Someone will get legal about it and will try to do something to call our stance into question. I fully expect that. And the more I talk about it on episodes like this, the more likely it is it's going to happen. But I thought it was worth the risk because I want you to be able to think this through. We cannot let the possibility of harm or loss of revenue or anything like that deter us from representing our king well and doing so with boldness and with courage and most of all with faith that he is going to take care of us and provide for us because we are being true to who he's called us to be in this world. Thanks so much for listening to Live, Build, Change. I so appreciate it. And if you are finding value in these episodes, there is one very important way you could help me out. 
And that is by passing these episodes along to one person or two people that you know would benefit from what you're hearing here on the episodes. You can do that by swiping right or left on the app that you're using to listen to this episode. Or if you're on iTunes or on the website, there are sharing buttons there where you can share this episode directly with someone via email or text. And please include a personal note because it makes so much more difference when someone hears from someone they know and hears the recommendation of why the episode would be beneficial. You can make a difference in the lives of others by helping them find out more about Live, Build, Change. Thanks so much 